Welcome everybody. I'm David Bader and I direct the Institute for Data Science at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I'm really pleased to host today's weekly data science seminar. We're pleased to have with us Dr. Tanya Berger-Wolf. Dr. Berger-Wolf is a professor of computer science and engineering, electrical and computer engineering, and evolution, ecology, and organismal biology at the Ohio State University, where she also directs the Translational Data Analytics Institute. As a computational ecologist, her research is at the unique intersection of computer science, wildlife biology, and social sciences. She creates computational solutions to address questions such as how environmental factors affect the behavior of social animals, humans included. Dr. Berger Wolf is also the director and co founder of the conservation software nonprofit Wild Me, home of the Wild Book Project, which enabled the first ever full census of the entire species, the endangered Gravies zebra in Kenya, using photographs from ordinary citizens. Wild Book has been featured in the media, including the New York Times, CNN, and National Geographic. Dr. Berger Wolf has received numerous awards for her research and mentoring including the University of Illinois Scholar, the UIC Dis Distinguished Researcher of the Year, the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Association for Women in Science Chicago Innovator, and the UIC Mentor of the Year. And I'm especially pleased to have Tanya here speaking today because many years ago, she was a postdoc with me and I'm just absolutely pleased to see her career shine now as the director of TDAI at The Ohio State University. She'll be speaking today on trustworthy AI for wildlife conservation, AI and humans combating extinction together. Thank you, David, and thank you for having me. I'm delighted, and I was going to, to, to to, if you were not uh, going to say that, I was going to mention that uh, it all started really uh, when I was a postdoc um, then at the University of New Mexico. And uh, I was still figuring out what to call the, this uh, field that I was venturing into and uh, modeling after the name of computational biology, which dealt mostly with molecular biology and saying, well, I wanna do that thing, but for ecology, and or population biology and so that, that I was still figuring out the name when I when I was a postdoc but uh, uh, that was really a wonderful opportunity to get started because because I had the freedom the intellectual freedom to explore to figure out how how to formulate questions and what are the right ways to answer them in a field which still didn't exist at the time. And I very much uh, appreciate and uh, I think credit you and uh, Bernard Moray with that freedom to, to explore, which uh, you know, the results of it in many ways originated then and there. So thank you. And thank you for, for inviting me and, and um, giving me the opportunity to, to talk about uh, a subject I'm particularly passionate about. So with that, I'm gonna share my slides. And in this talk, talk, I really do represent all of my multiple research personalities of uh, three departments and uh, plus an institute, as well as the uh, director of the nonprofit Wild Me and the co-founder of its project Wild Book of, with, that I will tell you today about. So if we look, at artificial intelligence and data science today. Uh, actually, before I get going, do you see the entire screen or is it blocked by Zoom banner? I see the entire screen, it looks great. Okay, fantastic. So if we look at data science and AI today, there's immediately apparent patterns of disparity and and uh, inequity in every aspect of it. You know, if you look at the top 10 AI researchers across the, across the globe, influencing technological disruption, you know, they all look kind of similar. Um, and 
the, the, certainly the gender <laughs> imbalance is evident. Uh, and if you look at uh, paper publications or who is actually working in AI and um, data science, data analytics, or even more generally in tech, then you know the, the, the underrepresentation of women and even more so of uh, minoritized populations is really evident and stark. If we look more global, this is US, well, some of it is global. And if we look more globally, then um, there is an added layer of disparities and inequities. This is the map of publications in machine learning and AI across the globe, the number of publications per country. The difference between those who produce the methodology and the technology versus those who are left to consume it if they can is again, very evident and unevenly distributed across the globe, particularly, particularly concerning if uh, this in the context of conservation where I work, a lot of the applications of what I do, if we look at the African continent. This is exacerbated, exacerbated by the fact that, uh, that the uh, cost of technology is also the bar for entry is very high. So not only uh, the ability to produce technology, new solutions, but also to even use the existing ones, the cost is high for uh, skill, for actual uh, computational resources, you cannot run it on your old laptop, and for energy that it takes. Uh, the, the, in many of the supercomputing centers, uh, as well as just big computational uh, centers of any kind, have their own energy substations in the US. That is not feasible for, the, for most of the world. So with that, how do we engender trust in the solutions that are created today using data, using data analytics, and using the, and, and uh, sorry, there is an echo. And particularly in places where the solutions are applied for, not for those who create them. So first and foremost, I think it has to be inclusive, the, the uh, inclusive and collaborative partnership so that indeed the solutions uh, that are created, are created with the people whom they benefit, not for them. That will have to change. That will immediately change, for example, the, the publication landscape of uh, the African continent. Change, we need to change who creates the solutions beyond the sort of the ultimate consumers that goes back to the uh, gender and underrepresented minority and uh, underrepresentation in technology solution creators, and particularly in data science. And we do need to build a global data science capacity. There is a lot of talk today also about the transparency, accountab in accountability, uh, and bias or the compensating and, and uh, de-biasing uh, AI, machine learning, data analytics, uh, but the transparency aspects of it, the fact that we need to have the solutions to be open source and open process, um, explainable where possible, uh, it's still the frontier of research. Uh, we have to be clear about our assumptions and uncertainty and limits, and there, there's a lot of conversation of how we communicate implicit assumptions and uncertainty to uh, to people outside of artificial intelligence and, and data analytics. And finally, uh, we have to be responsible for the outcomes. We, we as engineers, the fundamental engineering approach of being able to stand under the bridges that we build. Uh, for, for way too many years of com 
existence of computing, of the history of computing, kind of the approach has been that we create these solutions and off they go. Once these solutions are applied in the societal context, as we, they often do, as, as we often do and as they often are right now, we continue to bear the responsibility for the use of that technology. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And finally, safety, they do no harm. Uh, it is tempting, it's incredibly wonderful, wonderful and exhilarating to come up with a uh, new method in new machine learning approach, new data analytics solution that improves the accuracy of the um, task by 2%. But at what cost, right? If we're talking back to the cost of the use of technology itself, including the environmental cost of energy and, the, and, and waste, is it actually worth it? Or do we, you know, these 2% of improvement ultimately may not translate in the actual change of what's going on on the ground. And yet we've now, we're now paying much higher, both monetary and environmental cost for, for, the, for, for the no difference, for ultimately no difference. The, quite often the back of the envelope calculations with uh, like quick estimates work in practice, reasonably well, and considering the on the ground infrastructure just as well. We need to talk about data governance and absolutely about fairness and bias uh, of, the of the technology. And that is a whole other talk. So with that, and how do we do all of this in the context of conservation? So why is conservation important? The UN news, uh, the, the UN report that is that now comes out annually, used to be biannual, essentially puts the world of notice. We are losing biodiversity at an unprecedented scale and accelerating rate. What is we're in the middle of what is termed right now the sixth mass extinction, which is caused in large part by human activity. So the problem is we are not even, we don't even have the, the, the basic data to, to, to deal with that. The International Unit of Conservation of Nature Red List, this is the official organization that determines conservation and status around the, of species around the globe and tracks the world biodiversity. The UN report is based on data coming from IUCN Red List. When we say that the species are endangered, it's because the species commission for that particular species for IUCN Red List has determined the status of the species as endangered. Of the millions of species out there, IUCN Red List, IUCN Red List today tracks just over 130,000. It's a tiny fraction. But even with that tiny fraction, what does it mean to track? Well, of this 130,000 plus species, almost 18,000, their official status is data deficient, not endangered or vulnerable, data deficient. These are not obscure species. These are iconic species like killer whales. The official status of orcas, killer whales, was data deficient. For about for over forty thousand others, the uh, population trend is unknown, meaning that we don't know whether the popula global population is decreasing, increasing, or stable. Again, iconic species like polar bears are in that category. And even when we do know, or rather, the IUCN Red List puts something in the uh, trend and the and the status, the Information quite often is uh, not what it seems. So for uh, whale sharks, the largest fish on earth, the official population uh, size, global population size uh, in 2009 was estimated to be 103,000 with a standard error between 27,000 and 180,000. Well, that's a very scientific way of saying we have no clue, right? The 
Uh, based on that data in 2009, the species status was determined as vulnerable and the trend was stable. We'll come back to that. So with that state of data, how do we know? How do we track populations? How do we estimate global population sizes? And how do we figure out how fast the uh, elephant population of uh, in Africa declines or how far the whales travel or how many juvenile turtles survive to adulthood? The traditional old ways to put GPS or uh, GPS or radio colors, but there are not enough colors to, uh, or, or, or tags to put on all the animals to track them uh, all animals at all times everywhere. Uh, besides to do that, you actually need to bring a vet to tranquil to capture the animal, uh, to tranquilize them, uh, make sure to monitor their vital signs. And then each one of those uh, collars costs thousands of dollars and lasts for a couple of months if you really have a good battery um, for a large animal. And the 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 this process is dangerous both to the human and quite often to the animal themselves. So we need to reevaluate how we do it and how we do it non-invasively. Uh, pure observation doesn't cut it either. There are not enough scientists to track all animals everywhere at all times. But there are enough people because images today are the most abundant, readily available source of information about anything from what you had for lunch to what's going on in your backyard or in the global backyard, what animals are out there. And these images for wildlife are coming from scientists, field assistants, camera traps, drones, as well as tourists going on safaris and whale watching tours and posting their uh, videos and photos on social media. Uh, here, in fact, the two top uh, pictures are from a unique course that uh, uh, Dan Rubenstein from my colleague Dan Rubinstein from Princeton Ecology and Evolution and Biology and I started in 2010, which as a collaboration, multi-institutional, multi, uh, international collaboration, uh, um, transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary course to first give background in ecology and computer science and uh, data, data science to every participant and then uh, take them to the field, in this case in Kenya, to work on interdisciplinary projects that would not be possible without this collaboration between computer science, data, data science, and uh, ecology. So these images that come from all these variety of sources, millions, actually billions at this point, but millions of images, how do we get the information, the insight that we need out of them? Can you find all the elephants in those? I'll give you a second. Well, we built a system that does exactly that, uh, that can not only find all the images that contain the animals, we can automatically find where the animals are in those pictures. So put a, put a bounding box around each one, including that baby calf element, elephant hiding behind, behind mom in the background there. And identify not only the species, that this is a savanna elephant and humpback whale and gravy zebra and hawksbill turtle, but down to individual animal, that it is Zippy the zebra and Joe the giraffe and Terry the turtle and Willie the whale. And, oh. I wonder, how do they sort through them all and then identify, oh. Sorry, can you actually hear the video? I realize. Yes. All right, well then let's continue. That's an amazing amount of photos. I wonder, how do they sort through them all and then identify individual animals? Each image is processed through a series of convolutional neural networks and matching algorithms. The first network determines whether there are any animals of interest, in this case, zebras. The next set of networks localize each animal in its own subregion and classify the species. At this point, background segmentation is performed on the subregion to generate a rough mask of the zebra. Once this is done, key points are extracted from the zebra and feature descriptors are built. 
These descriptors serve as a sort of fingerprint that can be compared for similarity against previously identified individual animals in a large database. The scores from this comparison allow the system to decide which animals are the most likely matches. When the match has high enough confidence, it's accepted immediately. Matches that have lower confidence are shown to a human expert who then makes the final decision. We, this is this is the work that was done by uh, several PhD students and, and in collaboration with Chuck Stewart from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So this is the work that led by Jason Parham and John Crawl, both students of Chuck Stewart, uh, that created the entire machine learning pipeline from taking an image, classifying, some of it is off the shelf, but some of it is uh, uh, really innovative, state-of-the-art solutions for achieving the result, which is for the task, not improving, just focusing on improving the accuracy of, you know, each intermediate task by percent or two. And the ultimate task is finding the animals that are actually individually identifiable. Because if you try to identify every animal in the picture, then depending on the quality of the, you know, in the resolution, you might misidentify and that introduces more noise, more bias in the data ultimately into the, into the answer of how many animals are there. And once we have the ability to identify an individual animal, we can do that now for any striped, spotted, wrinkled, or notched animal, as well as using the shape of a whale's fluke or the dorsal fin of a dolphin. There are now seven different identification algorithms that, that are used in the system that we built on top of all of that technology called Wildbook. So this is an example of wild book uh, for cetaceans, for whales and dolphins. Uh, and it's called fluke book. This is Pinchy. This is a page from wild book, uh, from fluke book, wild book for whales and dolphins. And this is Pinchy, our celebrity uh, sperm whale. She is the most cited whale in wild book. She's been seen more than 500 times. She loves attention, lives around Dominica. As you can see here, all the sightings are around Dominica. She, uh, she survived a couple of hurricanes and was uh, wildly tracked, was tracked during that and, and, and tweeted about um, her whereabouts. Uh, but with information on when and where the image was taken, we can now do that. We can track an animal purely from photographs because we can re-identify them. We can uh, figure out this, the population by putting together information about all the animals in the population. We can estimate population size, uh, population range, species range, birth death dynamics, and even a social network uh, of the social species, which sperm whales definitely are, and you can see that there. So this is Fluke Book. More than uh, it's, uh, it now contains uh, most of the data from BOEM, from Bureau of Land Management, and we have a contract with NOAA. It's millions of images of 40, more than 45,000 identified individuals. We also collect information from uh, social media. So we built an intelligent agent that uh, uh, scrapes publicly posted, in this case, uh, YouTube videos of people's vacation uh, videos, identifies the ones that contain species of interest, in this case, whale shark, finds the frames, sends it off to uh, identification. And once we figure out who that individual is, using then using the natural language processing from title and description, we figure out when and where the video was taken. Uh, and that information is added to Wildbook to the appropriate page and the agent posts and the comments of the YouTube video, hey, at two minutes, 46 seconds, we found this whale shark. Here's everything we know about it with a link to the posting and the response that we get and people respond more than half, uh, actually more than 60% of people respond back, wow, this is amazing. And the most common response follow up is how can I help? that engages people right where they are. They didn't know when they were taking their vacation videos that they would be able to help science and conservation just by posting it out there, right? And suddenly they 
not only know who that animal is that shows up in their videos, they have quite a bit more context and the information about the whole species and where this one lived and what's its past history from all the sightings of that animal that had been there before. At the bottom of each page, that creates a network of collaboration among the people who've seen that whale shark in, or uh, any other animal that we have. At the bottom of the page also, we have all the scientists and conservation organizations that have the data about that specific animal in their data set. Quite often, they don't know that they share an animal's data. These are global species. There is not one project, not one organization that has information, even about one individual. And by only by putting these all these data together, like little puzzle pieces, we can create the global view of this global species, whale sharks in this case. Today, the wild book for whale sharks has more than 12,000 identified individuals. The data coming from 70, 76,000 sightings contributed by almost 9,000 citizen scientists, volunteers, more than 200 research and conservation projects and one very intelligent uh, AI agent that scrapes the social media posts. In fact, today, more than half, so my, the, that, that intelligent agent contributes more sightings to wild book for whale sharks than all the hum, human contributors combined. So majority of our data now comes from, uh, from uh, the, the, the uh, social media which brings its own problems. Uh, and the immediate one is, of course, the biases that come in. But uh, it does engage people where they are. It does make them part of the, uh, of the entire pipeline of the solutions. And that engenders trust because they know what they've contributed. The uh, entry for IUCN red list entry for whale shark is now based on data from uh, the wild book for whale sharks, the global population size is estimated from that data and the range has been adjusted based on the sightings from wild book. The conservation status of whale shark has been changed from vulnerable to endangered and population trend from stable to decreasing based on wild books data. It's not that the species are doing worse, it's that now we actually have the data to figure out how well or not well they're doing. And that is important that changes the policy and the resources that go into that decision. And the Species Commission trusts that data much more so than the previous one. The most comprehensive study on the biology of whale sharks was published by, uh, co-authored by 37 authors, most of whom met directly through these pages, through the pages of Wild Book, when at the bottom, they found out that they share data and they collaborated to understand the migration pa patterns, the, the population dynamics and the species, uh, and, and, and the species dispersal from nursing to adulthood. This again, changed how scientists are answering questions and studying the world and made them part participating part of participatories in the process of uh, answering this question, including all the data analytics aspects, data science. Today we have wild books for 53 species spanning the entire globe from marine to terrestrial, uh, based on seven identification algorithms and more than 80 publications have been published based on the methodology or based on data from Wild Book. The most recent one in NeurIP's paper on uh, Orcas identification. So hopefully IUCN red list entry for killer whales will be data deficient no more very soon. The technology of Wild Book also enabled that first ever in history, full census of the entire species uh, using photographs uh, from ordinary people. So the gravy zebra, the endangered gravy zebra, only estimated about 3000 of them left in the world. Majority, 95% are in Kenya. Uh, Kenya Wildlife Service uh, had a protocol for estimating population size 
that were, had high uncertainty bound until 2016. In 2016, in January, for the first time, for two days, hundreds of people uh, were driving around the country taking pictures of the right side of gravy zebras from school kids and uh, northern park, park rangers to US ambassador to Kenya, Bob Godak, they're in the middle, and tourists with telephoto cameras took more than 40,000 images of this amazing animal. Um, some of them held cameras for the first time in their digital cameras and for the first time in their life. By analyzing all these photographs, we produced an estimate of uh, the population size of 23, 52 plus minus 72. That was the most accurate ever estimate, population size estimate that was produced. The confidence bounds were so tight um, that uh, Kenya Wildlife Service went from saying, this is not how we do census to this is exactly how we're going to do census. And now you're on the hook every two years. And so in January, 2018, more than thousand people now from all over the world, from Kenya and from all over the world, uh, participated uh, taking pictures of, again, of gravy zebras, as well as we were asked to add reticulated giraffe to the count because until that point, the population has never, ever been counted. There has never been an estimate of the population size. And this particular giraffe is my absolutely favorite giraffe in the world. We call it emo giraffe um, because you can see the heart and a smiley face right there at the bottom of its neck. Um, and uh, it's a celebrity for sure. So. Uh, the, the population size estimate for gravy zebras was uh, in 2018 was 2,800 plus minus 150. So if anybody's keeping track, you'll notice that that de definitely did go up, confidently so. Um, and in 2020, in January 2020, as uh, my all my social media reminded me exactly a year ago, uh, we were, <laughs> well, just over a year ago, we were in Kenya for the uh, Great Gravis Rally of 2020. We're still processing data because we're re-engineering the technology a little bit and we put the data processing on hold. But that is the example of how you engender trust, how you go from, this is not how we do things, and take you know take your technology um, and to to this is how we're going to do things every aspect of uh, of trust sort of we exercise we got uh, uh, donations and uh, grant for, to purchase GPS enabled cameras so this is uh, Dan Rubinstein uh, led that aspect of the event very much so and organized the event uh, with participation with many other local Kenyan organizations. So we got the GPS enabled cameras uh, that we were able to, to give participants who didn't have their own. So having a camera, having access to the technology was not a barrier to entry. We created a whole protocol where we could synchronize people in different cars over driving around the country uh, with different cameras. Even the ones who did not have GPS in their camera could synchronize it to camera one camera that had, uh, that took a little while. We created, we created uh, uh, to books, booklets of explaining why pe what people are doing, why, why are they doing it when that every participant got, every participant got a tutorial um, on how this whole thing is going to proceed and how to use these GPS enabled cameras and what we're going to do it. This is, these are pictures from a tutorial we ran at, uh, in the north of the country uh, for Kenya Wildlife Service rangers. Uh, park rangers. These are rangers that protect uh, endangered species like rhinos and elephants and, and, and others, uh, right up all the way to the border with Ethiopia. And and tour guides. The these workshops ran as in this case in in English translated to Swahili, translated to Samburu, so double translation. Um, I learned how to say quite a bit in Swahili, but then turns out that GPS camera, GPS is GPS in, in every language. Uh, and so, so having trained, and turns out that, that this, what, what we needed to, to, to bring people together 
for them to be able to learn and to to then be able to do it for uh, on their for themselves and on uh, on their own was very little we 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 had to you know have the desire because everybody wanted to learn everybody wanted to participate uh, all we had to do was provide water that's a high resource uh, we also trained then um, conservancy uh, analysts for several conservancies more than uh, more than uh, this this represents about 10 different conservancies uh, and uh, conservation organizations to use wild book for analysis to and for data entry and data retrieval and data analysis so that we did we're not the bottleneck so the the uh, model was not that we'll take your data which is the new resource we'll take your data do some magic with it return the answers to you and then here's your uh, here's your answer trust us no this the the uh, tagline for the whole event was kenyans powering conservation uh, our youngest photographer was three years old. Everybody could participate and everybody uh, contributed. And then it is the Kenyan, the goal was, and the goal still is to ensure that it is the Kenyan organizations that can do the analysis and uh, follow the, the numbers all the way through and trust these numbers. The other aspect, as I mentioned, is events like this. So can we trust, can we actually count using photographs? Uh, or is there bias to where people see these animals? So from several events, uh, we analyze data, both you know, there, for spatial bias and, uh, uh, and, and site recite bias. So these are consecutive events. Uh, so these, event, these events are run on two consecutive dates. So we could look at the number of new sightings versus uh, sightings overall. You see that for Great Gravis Rally, on the, uh, the blue line is the new sightings versus gray one is the sightings overall. And essentially by mid morning of the second day, we don't, people didn't see any new animals. So by looking at it, that's why the confidence bonds were so tight because we essentially saw the collectively together the entire Kenyan population of gravy zebras over the course of two days. And that repeated as well in 2018 and, uh, uh, two th and 2020. And so because of these confidence, uh, tight confidence bonds, we can definitely say that the population has increased since from 2016 to 2018, definitely so, not only overall in the country, but for every single county. And because it increased in every single county, it, different counties have different uh, policies and different habitats and different resources. Uh, so that has different implications on how the species are managed. We also could look at the, um, the, the, the percent of uh, non-adults in the population, you need about 30% uh, of non-adults for the population to be sustainable, more than that to grow. Each, all countries, all counties, except for one, had, had reached that minimum in 2016. Since this is data from 2000, January 2018, that's, that was too early to talk about juvenile percentages. Um, the, more of them were born. So the uh, 2016 Meru, one county, uh, did not have enough juveniles. And the reason for that, since this is not an interactive version of the, of the talk, I'll, I'll give you the answer because it's a great reason. Uh, the reason is that Meru County does such a, did such a great job with lion conservation that there are too many lions per zebra. And, you know, particularly the juvenile, the baby zebras walking by barcoded snack, the lions are like, I'll take that one, as well as all the impala and, uh, gazelle, and other gazelles. And so the answer was uh, to try a, a contraception program for lions. So which a program which otherwise would be so controversial, right? But if you have good data, you can try it out and you can track it and you can uh, see whether it's actually working. You need trust for something that controversial. And there was enough trust and it worked. 
Um, the Kenya, so Kenya Wildlife Service and the six governors of the um, of the counties that have uh, gravy zebras in their counties signed on based on that data, based on that event, and the trust that was engendered with the the whole setup issued a proclamation of the new species endangered species management plan that put money, resources, land, and policy to manage these endangered species. And part of it was to monitor using the Great Gravis Rally event every two years, the progress of the species. And the goal is that it will be completely a Kenyans by a Kenyan run event for Kenya by Kenya. So Wild Book will be only a technology platform that will be used in the process. Kenya Wildlife Service Assistant Director uh, Simon Gital said, this shows the power of citizen science and machine learning for conservation. This is an incredible statement because there are three firsts in this. This is the first time, this is in 2018, that Kenya Wildlife Service you, uh, agreed to use a protocol uh, that was not the normal sampling protocol. This is the first time that they uh, used an outside technology, a new technology, right, for, uh, for the analysis and trusted it. And this is the first time that they used the words machine learning in a sentence. So that's great. Um, that is trust. And it is indeed by Kenyans for Kenyans. There is a great series called Wildlife Warriors produced by a nonprofit Kenyan nonprofit uh, Wild Me in collaboration with uh, Kenyan Citizens TV uh, and each uh, led by Polo Kahumbo. And each episode is about a different species and a different Kenyan hero who kind of leads the conservation for that species. And this one is about there is an episode about the gravy zebras featuring uh, Rosemary Warungo, who is the wildlife warrior, uh, researcher, special, uh, gravy zebra specialist leading this effort. The entry, IUCN entry for gravy zebras uh, is now updated based on data from Great Gravis Rally and the Wild Book for, um, gravy, for zebras. However, with the benefits that we're getting from using this wide set of sources from uh, you know, ordinary people and as well as just found data from social media, public data from social media, what is gold for scientists and conservation managers is unfortunately also highly uh, useful data for poachers and um, wildlife criminals. Geotagged images of endangered species are essentially pointers to poachers of a rhino is found here right now, or an elephant. Uh, just last year in uh, Kruger National Park, uh, a selfie posted on social media with an elephant uh, resulted in a poaching attempt just a couple of hours later. And you know, the statistics are that that uh, more than 50 elephants are killed just in Kruger National Park a, a, every year. So that is, uh, that is incredible statistics. This is really uh, becoming a serious problem. Uh, it is a risk. It is high, uh, it is highly lucrative business as well. And so uh, in collaboration with Ross Anderson, uh, we published a white paper and a, and a talk at UCINEX about the uh, cybersecurity aspects and the, the, the some privacy aspects of this data, so privacy for tigers. Uh, and we're continuing to work. So Wildbook itself is secure, fully secure, but we also, uh, my own research is looking at uh, bias and leakage of this information, how we would uh, protect it protect the endangered species uh, uh, while, uh, and, and don't accidentally uh, result in its extinction while trying to protect it. The other aspect of using social media and in general photographs is 
the bias. And there are many, many, many aspects of bias. So, you know, there's the true population and to take a photograph, if we're using photographs, that means that something, either camera trap or, or, or a tourist had to be there at the right time and the right place to even take pictures, to see those animals. Then deciding, there's a bias in deciding to take those pictures. We've analyzed, uh, we had a study uh, where we were uh, driving with tourists on their safari tours and sort of getting the, the, the SD cards of all the, everybody who was in the same car during the same drive. And the, the numbers of pictures range from, from uh, over 500 in two hours to four. Um, and the content, some are birders and will take only pictures of birds. Others are, this is their very first safari tour. So they'll take picture of every impala zebra um, and, 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 and bird on the first hour. And then, almost nothing in the second. And so there's high variability of what people decide to take pictures of. There's also bias of what of all of that they decide to post on social media. And we have study, we have done a study of that. Uh, and we have actually pretty good estimators now we can with high, uh, pr uh, with high uh, certainty, with high confidence tell you given an image whether it's going to be posted on social media or not. Then different social platforms I have different uh, uh, different ways of getting data from there with different resulting in different biases uh, and different models of estimating population, also different assumptions built into them. But ultimately what we want is the population estimate, which regardless of what methods you use in the intermediate, it's actually not worth the effort, the do no harm part, right? To estimate every intermediate bias. Besides, it's not estimatable. But you can, turns out, estimate the error overall, despite the fact that it is comprised of many, many intermediate biases. And so we've done, um, over the course of two master theses, um, uh, uh, actually three master theses, we looked at this uh, problem of estimating. Um, these are, uh, uh, both, both these projects are in 2018. Turns out that social media has about two year lag of posting images. So uh, the, uh, using our, uh, the purple points, adjusted models for estimating population size. This is for zebras, for gravy zebras versus the official thick black lines. We're much more accurate in the earlier years where there were official estimates versus the newer ones. And we're now actually expanded the study. And this is a project of 14 high school and undergraduate students uh, collecting data from four different platforms on six different species and understanding, sort of expanding, building models for estimating different parameters, but also understanding uh, how people use these different social media platforms for different species, how it changes. Uh, across the species and across the platform. So watch this space, it's coming, coming soon. And so hopefully uh, there is at least a little bit of a, of a sense of how AI and data science can enable science conservation and public engagement by building technology intentionally, building the processes intentionally that bring communities together and by working in partnerships to provide solutions that people trust. Because all you have to do is take a picture. Um, I will skip this, but this is uh, a, a group of uh, students from Kibera slums in Nairobi, who many of them for the first time, they participated in our events uh, in Kenya of counting animals using photographs. And for the first time, many of them have been to a park, to a conservancy, for the first time seen a wild animal. And that experience transformed their own view of the world. They're saying that they will now protect the animals. They will say no to poaching. And they started a conservation club in their school to educate others about wildlife conservation and this incredible resource in the country that is often not accessible to everybody in the country. 
And I want to thank the team of the, my fellow co-founders of Wildbook. Um, so that's Dan Rubenstein, Chuck Stewart, and uh, uh, Jason Holmberg, who is now executive director of WildMe, the nonprofit that is the home of Wildbook, and the team of Wildbook, as well as thousands of volunteers around the globe, and the support that we get from many organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. What an excellent talk. I was thinking as you were going through your um, through your talk, I remember back when I was in high school, my favorite book was uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And then in college, the, the fantastic book Last Chance to See came out, um, co-authored with Mark Carwardeen, who is a British zoologist. And um, so that was about 1990. And uh, I thought, you know, how would we ever do anything as a population with endangered species? And it's incredible to fast forward now, 30 years later, where you're doing the, this work. And it's just absolutely terrific to, to see this happening and using all of this data science and AI. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is indeed. You know, the, the, the goal here is not to replace, clearly not to replace humans, right? But to work in partnership with humans, to enable humans to do things better, faster, uh, more accurately. But uh, a big part of the thinking of how we develop this technology and particularly how we develop um, data science is to enable that collaboration, not only between, between technology and humans, but also among the humans themselves. So the collaboration among scientists, collaboration, participation across uh, for pretty much anybody, uh, democratizing and lowering the, the, the barrier to entry. And I think it is only if we do that together that we can solve a lot of the grand challenges because otherwise, yes, there is a danger that uh, you know, our children will not see many of those species that, uh, that are out there right now. So if anyone in the audience has questions, please use the, the chat. I see a questions come in from Claire, who thanks you for the great talk and the um, she remarks on the really cool technology. Is there any chance it could identify larger species from satellite images? Funny you ask, Claire. Um, so we right now are uh, really uh, working on uh, uh, satellite, using satellite images, and this is in partnership with other organizations to use satellite images uh, to track whales and uh, elephants. So identifying individual animals is not possible, but tracking, uh, I did, I, uh, so determining the species is, and tracking individuals is certainly possible. But the, the, the thing with satellite technology, with satellite imaging, is that it is turns out to be way more finicky than I thought it would be. I personally thought it would be, because uh, you have to have a clear day, right? And, uh, and no clouds, no haze, no. So heat produces lots of haze, and then there's cloud cover. And it has to be not obscured by trees, no shadow. So, so it's 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 works. It works a lot better in the ocean than in, and and you can see actually through the top part of the water surface than than on than on land. But yes. So there's a question from Marcin Papziki, who is joining from Warsaw, Poland. He asks, you mentioned drones, but not much about. Uh, much was there about drones in your talk. Could you please comment on potential role of drones? Right, so uh, a lot of the, uh, so you can track populations, we can certainly, and we tested, we can identify animals from, from drones. Uh, the, and, and there are also others like Bistra Dilkina and Melin Tambe who are working on uh, using drones and other technology to respond to poaching uh, and, and other crim wildlife criminal uh, events and to patrol and monitor. The thing is that uh, uh, for a large part of the African continent, the 
drones are actually not allowed. <laughs> so, um, but we do work and people are starting to work a lot with drones. And if you look at the recent New York Times article on sharks, uh, which also mentions wild book, the, the, uh, again, for marine animals, people are using uh, drones to track because you can go much further out into the oceans and, uh, and, and in countries where we can use drone technology, people are using drones to collect that information about animals and to track them. The, um, there is even an organization nonprofit called Drones for Conservation that will deploy drones for you. The thing is uh, that I want to make clear that we, Wild Me or Wild Book, uh, the project Wild Book, we do not collect data. We provide the platform for other people to add data, upload their own project data, or use it to integrate and synthesize data. So we explicitly do not own any data. They um, do not take ownership of any data. I mean, I own the data that okay. I go. When I go in, in Kenya, I upload my own data there as well. Um, but they the model is that it is open source, open collaboration, protected data. And we have to protect data for endangered species. So we have uh, pretty sophisticated, as I mentioned, pretty sophisticated context aware access control system in place to provide uh, different, access, different levels of access for different roles. But uh, we do not open data because of the dangers that I just outlined. I, I know from, from some years ago that there's a zoological network globally among zoos that mm -hmm. trade information about their populations and endangered species. Have, have you integrated at all with the, the zoos around the world? So a lot of our work is actually supported by zoos and aquaria. Um, so the, the, the work on giraffes and jaguars, for example, is supported by the San Diego Zoo. Uh, we collaborated uh, on some aspects of it also with the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago and very much uh, with the Lincoln Park Zoo also in Chicago. The uh, whale shark and fluke book, wild books uh, supported by the Georgia Aquarium and other aquaria uh, as well. So yes, there is a strong collaboration. The thing is that the data that are in wild book are on wild uh, populations. Uh, but today, a lot of the aquaria and zoos actually uh, do conservation work and, and, and lead conservation projects for the wild relatives of the species that uh, you can find at zoos and aquaria. So you may have seen from Facebook about two weeks ago, I became a birder in Manhattan and captured this hawk just uh, across the, the balcony from me. And I learned about all these great tools like Merlin from the Cornell lab and I saw you at eBird. And um, I, I was just thinking, uh, as I walk around, I see all these pigeons and wondered, you know, could you use your technology to track all the pigeons in New York City, identify them and uh, understand the population? I would love for somebody to try it out. Uh, there is the first algorithm for identifying individual birds uh, has been developed uh, at Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior and uh, in the lab of Damien Farine, who was my former postdoc, so your grand postdoc. Um, the, uh, so, so it's starting, it's getting there, and we've talked uh, on and off to eBird to kind of how we would collaborate because because wild book strengths is individual identification. So when, as this is becoming a reality and we're now in conversations about several species that are individually identifiable, that we will connect essentially API to API with eBird. Um, similarly, we uh, are in conversations that are kind of moving towards actual implementation, collaborating with another great project uh, Wildlife Insights, which is enabling support for uh, all the camera trap data collected by various projects around the world, led by Smithsonian, um, Moore Foundation, and the Wildlife Conservation Network. So they get the, the images, they process them up to a certain point, identify species once there's something that's individually identifiable. 
they can hand over to us. So there's a lot of, as well as uh, also talking to iNaturalist, another great con uh, citizen science platform for, for sightings of nature. Um, they also use Merlin, a version of Merlin. So, so there's a lot of collaboration in this space because the problem, the challenges are so great and so um, pressing, so urgent that I think collaboration is the only way to go. There is, there is no, there is a friendly competition, but only the, you know, uh, once we figure out how to do something, we share it immediately with everybody else. And this is true for the whole, for the whole community. So Tanya, thank you again for a wonderful talk. It's always great to see you. I love the work that you're doing and I look forward to seeing your successes at the Translational Data Analytics Institute at The Ohio State University. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for listening and uh, joining me, and go take pictures. Take care. <laughs>